Thank you, Tom. Um, that's the kind of introduction I like a lot. <laughs> um, so um, I will uh, try to assume very little uh, because uh, maybe you don't think about circulation all the time. So um, in a fluid flow, you draw a contour, arbitrary contour, and take a line integral, um, u dot dl, l being along the contour, and that's the circulation. And A is the area that this contour uh, circumscribes. By Stokes theorem, it is also related to vorticity like this. This is the normal component of vorticity integrated over the area uh, that this contour uh, includes. So that's the quantity. And it's of great interest in fluid dynamics. Um, just, to, um, just to show you that if you want to calculate the lift around uh, on the wing of an aircraft, it's linearly proportional to the circulation, for instance. Also, velocity and density and all that. So it's of uh, some consequence. And the thing I am going to do, uh, this uh, talk, um, started with uh, at least the part that I will tell you about, started with uh, Sasha Migdal's uh, two papers he wrote uh, many years ago. Uh, in these uh, papers, he basically derived a functional equation for the circulation. He didn't solve it, um, mostly because I think uh, nobody knows how to solve it. Uh, but uh, the fixed point of that equation. And then uh, he showed that the minimal surface area really satisfies that. And uh, minimal area is of great interest to mathematicians in general, and he got involved in uh, many complications relating to that. It's, uh, in fact, not very easy to extract uh, things you could, uh, uh, you could make uh, comparisons with uh, from his two uh, talks, if, uh, two papers, which if you have actually tried to read them any time. Uh, but then what happened was, at that time, um, I was working on the wakes behind cylinders, so there is a lot of interest in circulation around these vortices. And then I happened to uh, chance uh, on uh, Sasha's paper. And so we wrote up a little paper on the circulation wake behind a cylinder using some of those ideas. Um, then uh, there was this paper which came much later. And we could also do these kinds of things using numerical simulations. So these are in a steady state? Sure. These are in a statistically steady state, fully developed, uh, so there is no time uh, in a direct way <coughs> for statistics. Now at that time, uh, you can see they all followed uh, one after the other, you know, it's very, very close. And um, at that time, uh, people were working on turbulence in a box like this, which was relatively small. 128 cube is now nothing. And uh, we pushed it to 512. Uh, but still, it was relatively small Reynolds numbers. And it was really hard to um, conclude anything. But that's the units. Which one? 256 or 512. This is just the grid points in a box. So you take a box of 2 pi length, and uh, you take uh, grid points which are 512 along a line. No, no, no dimension? Uh, the dimension would be 2 pi divided by 512, if you want. And uh, that smallest uh, grid size would correspond to the, the grid size would correspond to the smallest scale in the flow. I mean, that's the technical thing. That's why you take a bigger box, you can get smaller and smaller scales, uh, technically. Is it a it's a periodic box, yeah. And uh, now, however, we have data that goes up to 8192 cube uh, compared to 128 and things like that. And in fact, there are some data which I won't use um, much, which is 16384, which is about as big as you can actually compute at the moment. And so we wrote up this paper, which is uh, in this archives. 
Are these spectral methods or? These are pseudo spectral methods, yeah. You sort of go back and forth from the physical space to spectral space. And um, so it's forced at uh, large scales in some way. And then uh, you develop uh, small scales as a function of uh, uh, your iterations. And at some point, it's uh, evolved enough that you think it's uh, fully developed. You plot anything uh, like the energy dissipation or something as a function of time, they usually not varying a lot. And so you think that you have reached a steady state. Um, so I sent this, uh, this thing to Sasha Migdal. And Sasha really got excited about that. And uh, he since has really been doing only physics, believe it or not. If that's my only claim to fame is to get Sasha in, again engaged in uh, physics, that's actually already um, important enough. And uh, he wrote up three papers in succession which he put up an archive, which you can which you can read, and then uh, Sasha Polikov got interested in it as well, and so you see now uh, there is now a whole lot of interesting things. And Victor Yakot, uh, who also has some comments. When you say, when you say you're doing these uh, simulations, you're doing them for these loop. These. Uh, uh, we just compute the velocity as a function of uh, space. Yes. And then from the velocity, you just draw contours, yeah. and you compute the circulation around these. And that's the quantity on which you do statistics. And, and which, what's the size of the contour? Yeah, you will, you will, you will see all that. So that's the um, uh, background for um, what's been happening. So this is only a notation. Um, so we, this is the box. It's closed on all sides. It's a periodic box. And the largest uh, scale is L. And that contains a fluid of constant density and uh, some viscosity. And it's forced at some uh, large scales. And what's that? Deterministic forcing? Yeah, you can, uh, I mean, in these calculations, what is done is the first three wave numbers. It, they're forced to have uh, constant forcing as a function. It's deterministic, yeah. You can make other types of forcing as well. So it's forcing, and the forcing is independent of the fluid, or it's correlated to the fluid. So sometimes people force in such a way to have something or other constant in the fluid, and that means actually it's not a given force. It's the energy of these uh, modes that are forced is fixed in time. That's what is fixed. And in the forcing or in the, in the, result, in the solution? In the forcing. Okay. And the initial conditions are chosen from some smaller calculation. Uh, you uh, sort of make, make it. Uh, the forcing yeah. is it is deterministic, yeah. In fact, uh, Eric Sigia, to whom I sent this also, said, why don't you do stochastic forcing like you are um, implying somehow? And yeah, that should be done. But anyhow, uh, yeah, yeah th that's what is done. And uh, so it has a certain energy, which gives you a certain velocity scale. And so this number is supposedly a large number. And I will show you what kind of Reynolds numbers uh, we get. And uh, so you get uh, successive instabilities. And um, so this is now folklore. The energy cascades somehow from large to small with an energy transfer rate that is given by epsilon. That's only the notation. And uh, so as you go down in scale size, say r, which is now going down, uh, uh, which is smaller than l. The Reynolds number goes down as well. And for some R that is equal to eta, which is very small compared to L, you have uh, this should be eta. This Reynolds number is unity. So that says that the eta is the scale beyond which no further scales will develop. Um, although in, in practice, there are scales smaller than that and uh, all that. So Kolmogorov scale, uh, this is the eta, uh, is b given by this. This is the rate at which energy 
gets dissipated, which is the same thing as the rate at which energy gets transferred, and viscosity and dimensional arguments tells you that. So now what is this uh, ur, that is the velocity characteristic of the scale of size r? So if you think of uh, an eddy or something like that, uh, very uh, just a vague thing, of size r, it's moving in the flow, uh, background flow. And uh, so let's say it is taking uh, some kind of um, contour like that. So this velocity would be, let's say, the average of the velocity here and the average of the velocity there. So uh, that u is, let's say, the average of the two, or sum of the two, or something like that. So this really doesn't tell you much about the properties of this uh, scale. But if you take the difference between these two velocities, well, that will tell you how the scale deforms and evolves and things like that. And that is this ur, this uh, velocity characteristic size r. Oh, see. Um, I, I, so this one here is u2 minus u1, let's say I call that the delta ur or something like that. So that's just a notation. Now, uh, just to remind you, uh, those of you who don't think about this all the time, uh, you remember the Kolmogorov relation, that is the spectral density uh, as a function of this uh, wave number at some fixed Reynolds number, has this form, um, which is k to the power minus 5 thirds. And then you have a function of k eta. When the argument k eta becomes uh, large or small, this function behaves in some fashion. So uh, for instance, when uh, this is uh, a k eta is very small, this one assumes uh, goes to unity, and then you have the celebrated 5 thirds law. The Fourier transform of that will, uh, will be something like that. So r to the power 2 thirds, all this stuff. <laughs> and uh, one of the other celebrated results so is the that phi, the. Uh, can you do this for minus yeah. the phi over gamma? Which one? Th this is spectral density. So you integrate that, it will give you the energy. Uh, so, so how energy is distributed? It is distributed among the wave numbers, uh, K. One of the other celebrated results of Kolmogorov is that if you take the third moment of this delta UR, it has some well known form. Uh, which is uh, known even to the constant. This is in the inertial range, that is the region where small compared to the forcing scale and large compared to the dissipation scale. Now to uh, others here, it, this may remind you of the uh, critical scaling. You have uh, free energy or something like that, which has some forms that way. Uh, where this is the critical distance from the critical temperature, and there is this issue of universality. And so, um, by the way, Kolmogorov uh, preceded the critical scaling in, uh, in uh, 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 statistical physics. Um, so one looks for uh, that sort of thing uh, here as well. And uh, the normal scaling is, uh, instead of the second power or third power, you can take this to any power. And uh, just an extrapolation from here, well, uh, two thirds for second power, one for third power, so for p, it should be some p by three. A large part of the work in recent years has been to examine this and see if that is true or not. And in fact, the consensus is that um, this is not this is not true. So you have anomalous scaling, where this is not p thirds, and the difficulty has always been that you have to have a, a finite, a well-known inertial range in order to check all this stuff. And if the Reynolds number is small, that inertial range is very small, and so you have to be a little careful. For example, for this, for the Reynolds number that I am talking about, uh, if you look at this relation, this relation, if you take this divided by four fifths epsilon, it should be linear, um, and the power, the number is 0.8, and you get this uh, very nice uh, line, but not for a very large uh, 
range of scales. This is the scale here. That's the quantity. So um, uh, it has been difficult, really, to be sure that uh, you are fitting power loss to the right region and how big this region is and so on. But at least you have to have uh, some range like a decade or a decade and a half in order to be able to say something. And here you can see that there is such a thing. So that's the standard stuff. And what we know is that, I am sorry I changed uh, p to m here, but if you plot the zeta p as a function of p, this is the order of the moment, what you find is that, um, that this is the Kolmogorov line and this is the actual data. Now you're going up to 20th moment, so you have to have enormous amount of data and make sure moments converge and so on. But okay, we can talk about that. So it's clear that it deviates from the Kolmogorov substantially. And in fact, for passive scalars, this deviation is much more spectacular. It never follows the Kolmogorov line, but sort of saturates almost exactly like the Kraken model. So, or the Burgers, for instance, which is sort of uh, constant after the uh, first moment or something like that. So, I think there is anomaly for sure, and this has consumed a lot of uh, time. And there are models you can create. Uh, you know, some models do quite well for low order moments, and not so well. So it's high anomalous exponents have a physical interpretation about yeah. In, 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 in yeah, well, for example, for passive scalars, uh, its interpretation is that um, uh, the, the passive scalar um, sort of shows sudden jumps, and then it sort of does this. So there are these huge uh, jumps uh, from 0 to 1. In a way, this is a passive scalar, so let's call this theta as a function of x or t or something this like that. This temperature, a function of x, uh, this is the kind of behavior it has. Very sudden jumps. So you go to the next point in space, it almost jumps from uh, zero to unity. And uh, there is, this happens uh, relatively often. So in fact, this tells you that the moments, higher the moments have to saturate so more or less. Seem like a good measure of what's going on here, right? uh, Well, it, it it, that's right, yeah, in fact. Uh, I mean, it you seem like you, the picture you yeah. drew is much more informative. Much more informative, yeah, in <laughs> fact, yeah. But that's definitely the case. Um, now, this is the background. Uh, now I calculate the, go for the circulation as we talked about. So I have a contour any contour, uh, we'll discuss what sort of contours I take. I go around this contour or loop and calculate this uh, circulation. Uh, sometimes we use this to compute, that is, uh, you compute vorticity from the velocity data, uh, take the dot product with the normal vector. Uh, sometimes it is convenient to do this um, as opposed to this. But in fact, we have done both for contours. Uh, for, um, and, and these thick. contours are, are fixed, right? You, you, they're fixed or do they move with the fluid at all? Uh, no, they're fixed. Uh, um, and I will tell you the shape of the contours and things like that in a minute. So um, this is the kind of data which you may not be interested in. So the length scale ratio in the highest Reynolds number is a few thousand, so which is, I think, a very reasonable thing, and uh, so it's a big business calculating these things. So you have a huge number of processors and uh, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, that's all by way of background. And now what uh, I have plotted here <coughs> is I have my box, which has full of velocity vectors at every, any given point. So in a plane, I draw a contour, I draw a rectangle or a square to start with compute the circulation around it, and assign the value at the center of this contour to, the, to that point, and move to the next one and do the same. And I plot that circulation as a function of, let's say, a spatial coordinate. And this is uh, normalized by its uh, standard deviation. So you can see that it really is uh, within a few four standard deviations or three standard deviations like that. It's not like 
huge excursions uh, from the mean value. This is for uh, one box size, and this is for another box size. And to uh, tell you, there are energy dissipation, for instance, uh, at high enough Reynolds numbers, some peak values like this are a few thousand times the mean value. In here, it's really much, much more well behaved. OK, so that's that. And um, so in that bottom picture with yeah. the big spike, what was that? This is the energy dissipation as a function of a space, yeah, spatial <coughs> coordinate. So now, um, what I will show you is I take a box, LX and LY, um, some fixed thing. I calculate the circulation around it. I move it to the next position. I do the same, etc. I do it over the entire box. And I calculate what the probability density of the circulation is as a, function, uh, as a function of the circulation itself. So, and I have to make sure that LX and LY are both within the inertial range. Uh, both fairly short. So, uh, uh, well, the inertial range goes from some units like 100 to 1,000 or so uh, in my units. Uh, you, shall I shall show you this? So let, let me go back here. This is the inertial range, for instance. It's from some, say, 100 or so to about 1,000. So that's the oh, kind that's, of range. That's, that, those, are the, those, are the, those are where you're calculating. That's where I'm calculating it. Of course, I can do this, and I will show you a little bit about what happens if you stray outside. But the general idea is, if you are looking for some universality, you would find it only in this region. Yeah, of course. Yeah, otherwise you're getting dissipation. Yeah, that's right. So, so now, so that's the box, and uh, so that's the probability density. So this is the circulation around a contour whose area is this, uh, normalized by its means root mean square. And this is the probability density. The area under that will give you the mean square, uh, will give you unity. Um, so now, this is for different boxes. Um, you can see that they are all uh, they're different. And the area um, contained in all these boxes is the same. So um, to within a uh, very small percentage, so 40 by 96 is the same as 80 by 48 and the same as everything else. So I have various rectangles, uh, all of them circumscribing the same area. And one of Migdal's result was, results was that the probability density function is, is only dependent on the area of the contour, not the, not the shape of the contour, not the aspect ratio. Not the aspect ratio. I actually think it's a very interesting result. And that is what makes the whole thing interesting and plausible, because otherwise you can do any contours and very complicated. So, so to a large degree, this seems to be uh, true. I mean, you have to remember that both of them have to be contained in the inertial lens, so there is not that much flexibility. You can't have a very thin contour like this, because one side will fall out of the inertial range. And I will tell you, I'll show you what happens if I do that. What is the behavior of the vorticity in this frame? Vorticity is highly fluctuating and uh, has but very big, uh, yeah. suggests that the integral of the normal component of the vorticity is uniform. Uh, you have a kind of uh, inequality, right? Not you have an inequality, you don't the have. Uh, in, in that range, it must be, well, all, all I know is this, right, Peter? Um, I, uh, so a gamma A is integral of omega dot n dA, right? This is, okay. this is what it is. Now, if I take gamma A to the power P, this is less than or equal to some, I mean, by Schwartz inequality, I will have some powers of omega dot n. Sure. 
but this e <laughs> I'm normalizing by this. If I don't normalize, I, I can also show you what it will be like. So, but this is an interesting result, in my opinion. I mean, there are devi deviations uh, here a little bit, but um, it's also true that uh, things like this, just 32 falls outside the inertial range, for instance, a little bit. No explanation at all. Even today, uh, after Migdal spent so much time on it, there is no. It's like a, an exponential. I mean, it seems like a well, well, clearly an exponential. I know. I know. In random matrix theory, it seems to have that structure. Yeah. So uh, we should discuss this. Uh, but so far, there is no explanation for this. So, um, so I would say that circulation statistics are sensibly independent of the aspect ratio of the loop, uh, as long as the lengths are both contained in the inertial range. Uh, I think that makes life very simple. Um, well, is this actually this requires more rigorous testing, which I will show you a little bit more about. Uh, for example, here is plotted um, the root mean square of the circulation normalized in some way against the area. But this is now uh, by one of them is a square, and the other one is a rectangle with an aspect ratio of 4. And uh, OK, they plot uh, on top of each other, more or less. This is all in a given plane? This is in a given plane, yeah. This is a plane? Yeah, if it is isotropic, uh, homogeneous, it should not matter. Uh, and it does not matter. Um, so this, I think, is, uh, is uh, interesting. Actually, you can uh, take the ratio of these two symbols. And the ratio of the two symbols is here. It is not exactly unity, as you can see. And the range over which you should, you should uh, really be worried about is this is the inertial range. So it varies from 0.96 to about 0.93 or something like that. It's not exactly unity. So what is the, uh, sorry, I didn't catch what the inset is. Uh, this is just the ratio of the two symbols. Oh, okay. If they were identical, it should be unity, and it is not exactly unity. So there is uh, some of that. What kind of error bars? Uh, the error bars are shown here. In here, I I statistical error bars are really negligible. They are s smaller than the symbol size. <laughs> but there may be systematic errors, like the way Peter pointed out. It may be a different forcing will give you slightly different result. And this, all of this stuff, it's not completely clear on those. But statistical errors are essentially non-existent. Um, now, uh, you can do even, even uh, differently the same thing. I can also do this. I can uh, plot this circulation, uh, uh, the square of this, uh, the, the uh, standard deviation, as a function of the perimeter. It's the same area, but now what is plotted is the perimeter. So you see it is not uh, exactly constant. It is slightly going down, but it is not a huge, huge change. So it does depend, uh, technically it does depend on the area somewhat, but I cannot guarantee that everything is perfectly in the inertial range, and so there may be some issues which we have to look at more carefully. So um, higher Reynolds numbers are always desirable. If I don't take them in the inertial range, I go to the dissipation range. As a function of perimeter, you see there is a much uh, stronger variation. So this area law, which, uh, which is what uh, Sasha called it, is valid in the inertial range, but certainly not outside of it. I think that's the first uh, lesson that I learned from uh, this whole exercise. So now what about a more complicated uh, area loop like this? Suppose I have a figure eight loop like this. Still, they're all in the plane. I can consider uh, them in different planes uh, that I, we haven't done yet. Uh, this is the question Joel was asking. So I can imagine having a contour here and another contour in this plane. 
And then uh, what should matter is the minimal area, which is according to the theory. The minimal area is not uh, the sum of these areas, but it is like the soap film that sort of stretches out uh, one to the other. So that's very interesting, but uh, we will not do this. Now, one thing you can do is the circulation here has a certain sign, uh, which is going like this. But the circulation here has an opposite sign. All right, you can see that. So should, we, should I consider the area as the vector area or the scalar area? So that's the first question. And uh, so uh, let me say this. If Kolmogorov scaling works, uh, this will go like a to the power 2 thirds, because circulation is velocity times a length scale. Velocity goes like um, r to the power 1 third. So it becomes r to the power 4 thirds, and that is area to the power 2 thirds. And if the scalar area rule holds, the area is equal to sum of these two squares, that is L1 squared plus L2 squared. So I should have uh, variance going like uh, the sum of these squares, sum of these to the power 2 thirds. If on the other hand, I have uh, the vector area uh, as a, the thing that should matter, then I sh it should go like L1 squared minus L2 squared to the power 2 thirds. I can, I can write this as uh, delta 2 thirds. Uh, this delta is L1 minus L2. And if I fix delta, that is uh, the difference between these two length scales is fixed now, uh, then it should go like L1 plus L2 to the power 2 thirds. Uh, dimensionally, it should go like area to the power 1 third. In fact, it is almost exactly true if delta is small, it should go like A to the power <coughs> 1 third. So I must be able to uh, distinguish between these two in experiments. And what you find is it's always 2 thirds. It's not, not, there is no 1 third anywhere at all in sight. So this is the variance, uh, a standard deviation as a function of the area of the loop. Area is L1 squared plus L2 squared, or whatever you know, area so you want. It is not the vector. It is the scalar. I think this has some uh, important implications. And uh, you see here, this goes like a to the power 1, because this is like the Kolm dissipative scale, where everything is linear. And you can actually show it should be just uh, li uh, linear uh, for small boxes uh, in the dissipative range. And then when the boxes become very large, then it saturates somehow. It's you know, bounded by uh, the box size and things like that. So I think this is a very interesting result as well. So uh, it certainly needs more scrutiny. but. Because um, so the, this is holding well outside the inertial range on the large scales. Everything is inside the inertial range. But the box size is now getting a few of uh, thousand. Uh, uh, this is uh, a. This is the area. Yeah, area is ten to the power six. Yeah. Means a, a or eta is about ten to the power three. Yeah, right. Yeah, you can if you remember this uh, graph, which I can go oh, back. Yeah, it's. It's about 1,000, yeah. So it's about right. So, um, so that's uh, uh, sort of interesting. Now, um, let me do one more thing. I mean, this is like the Kolmograph somehow, a to the power 2 thirds. So I take it literally and ask for circulation, will Kolmograph work somehow? Uh, I have no theory behind it, and Sasha's theory is different, uh, which I will describe later on. Um, so uh, circulation has this dimension, u times r. As I already said, it goes like r to the power 4 thirds. So I'm going to say, I'm going to ask, what's the probability density of gamma r divided by r to the power 4 thirds? If Kolmogorov uh, holds, this must be a universal function. R right, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I find, you see. I mean, it has some weird shape, <laughs> surely. But uh, you see, these are, uh, there are different colors here, and some few, few, few curves, like five of them. And they all plot uh, on top of each other, except uh, these tails, where, of course, they deviate, which you can't see here, but, uh, but you can see them expanded. Uh, the, so somehow, 
at least at uh, this level, um, it looks like a uh, Kolmograph uh, yeah, works. So I, I guess I don't understand this plot. Yeah. Uh, so I have gamma r cubed divided by r to the power 4. Yeah. This is just a normalization factor. Yeah. So this is my variable whose probability density I compute. Oh, that's the yeah. And so that's uh, how it looks. So it's not? It's not Gaussian, no. uh, definitely not. Uh, but it is some complicated uh, universal function. I mean, what happens at the origin? Right? Right. Yeah, so um, oh, okay. gamma R zero, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what's uh, happening okay. there. Yeah. So um, that's interesting. So now the, at least uh, it gives you some thought that maybe. Um, Kolmograph uh, scenario might work sort of for the circulation. Uh, don't know whether it's true or not. We will see in the next uh, thing. So now, I can compute various moments of circulation, so peat moment, as a function of the size of the box, and do the usual scaling. And as I want to know what the scaling is. Uh, this is uh, clear, is it not? Uh, so I'm for various box sizes. Now I'm going to take only squares because according to my demonstration, squares only area matters, not the, uh, not the aspect ratio. And uh, so I do this for various box sizes and get this moment. And this is for moment two, moment uh, four, moment six, and moment eight. And if there were scaling, this should, uh, this should have a, a power law uh, over the some scaling range, which should be somewhere in this, uh, in this region here somewhere. And uh, actually take the slopes of these and plot them here. Um, if this were linear, if, there were, if these lines were straight, you should have some region of constant slope on these plots. And uh, in fact, they are not bad. See, this is the second power is the fourth power, sixth power, and the eighth. This is the inertial range, these two lines uh, marked there. Do you get better if you plot, plot against the gamma 2 amount of against the, like the, the uh, yeah, 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 we can do that. I and mean, it's actually much nicer. Uh, so but I. Yeah. That this is how you actually claim the universe. Uh, that's, uh, that's correct. I, I should do that. Yeah, but I just uh, did it straight. Um, so, these lines I have drawn are the Kolmograph lines. Uh, so, this is the second moment for which it's trivially Kolmograph. It's trivially, I say, because I've already shown. For the fourth, it is slightly below the Kolmograph line. Uh, sixth, it is uh, substantially, well, below. And for eighth, uh, it is uh, even further below. So, it's not exactly Kolmograph, but it is close enough. And I want to show you how close and things like that. So exponents fall below K41, but not by much, I say. And I will show you what I mean by that in the next plot. So I take these uh, scaling exponents, that is the slope of these slopes of these lines, for various values of p, plot them against p, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And uh, they are straight. As far as I can tell, they are linear. I mean, OK. I will show you later on that linear is not exactly correct, but it's pretty reasonable. If uh, Kolmograph were right, they would be linear as well, but it would be a different slope. Maybe his slope would be 4p by 3, and what you find is 7p by 6. I mean, you shouldn't take 7 and 6 too literally, but um, uh, I should have said 1.16, but I like uh, uh, integers. integers, so I put it like that. So uh, that seems to be pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And then, so the scaling is closely linear with the R of the moment. But shouldn't they match at certain points? Uh, I mean, if P is equal to 3 or something? Uh, no, there is no, no such thing for circulation, as far as I know. Okay. Um, you, there is no such thing. Maybe Peter can tell me differently. Uh, it would be nice to know if there is such a thing. <coughs> In fact, uh, Kolmograph will tell you it should be 4, I think. And what we measure is 3.95 or 9.6 or something like that. 
And if I knew that it was really 4, I would fudge everything to be 4. But since I know nothing like that, I just use whatever I get uh, as honestly as possible. Uh, this is what everybody does for velocity uh, structure functions. Everybody knows it should be 1 for third order. Everybody fudges it to be 1. one <laughs> and everything else is, uh, is, is uh, whatever it is. So, no, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, uh, again, you can define it through some inequalities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, uh, it's in yeah, our yeah. paper, but it is not, yeah. not equal, equalities. Or it through inequalities. Yeah, you, through inequalities, you can, yeah. you can so relate that. One, you get to the one third from, from growth key, you subtract one, you get one sixth. And you would expect that that you are to go to like R to one sixth by this uh, no, 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 suppose you are saying you over 6 and you do dimensional analysis, reverse it and tell me what delta you are. Is it R to 1, 6? What is the delta you are? No, 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 no. It doesn't have any such relation, simple relation. Only dimensionally, yeah, you can do it, but. Yeah, so what is dimensionally? Is it 1, 6? That's why I guess it's not also. Probably, I didn't compute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Should be. You get the one I should subtract one. I should subtract one. I should subtract one from uh, from uh, seven six. So one six is uh, what uh, that's, you are that's calculating. The if, if everything is simple and dimensionally correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it is dimensionally correct, that should be the result. So let me say uh, now. But it's better that it's your exponent is bigger than one. I, I made, made that joke from the beginning. You better be able to subtract one. So, Sasha Migdal gets one. So that's that's totally discontinuous field. And I will uh, tell you how he obtains it. It's sort of interesting. Uh, let me finish my okay. results, uh, and then I will sort of start interpreting okay. them. Uh, so, just uh, to show you how it compares with velocity increments, what I plotted here is a function of the art of the moment the difference between Kolmogorov and the actual measured thing divided by the Kolmogorov value. So it's a relative difference uh, between Kolmogorov and the actual thing divided by Kolmogorov. This is for the velocity uh, structure functions. And this is for the, for the uh, circulation. But you didn't fix your, your blue line should be exactly at zero above three. And it's uh, no, it is zero, right? Is it? Uh, it okay. It's three. Three is zero. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> so um, you see, I mean, uh, there is a difference. So it, this is the Kolmogorov would be zero. Uh, would be exactly zero. So uh, velocity increments uh, have uh, say thirty-three percent difference for order 10, whereas this is probably like 10% uh, or something like that. And uh, furthermore, this has a much simpler behavior than uh, this uh, one for which you don't know what the formula is. So circulation is certainly less intermittent from my uh, reckoning uh, because it deviates uh, less from the Kolmogorov. Okay. Then, you can actually do this. This is a linear thing. So you can, so it's sitting on a fractal set which, whose dimension is not 3. If it were exactly 3, it would be Kolmogorov. So it is sitting on a fractal set of some sort. And uh, uh, taking this to be 7, 6 p, the dimension of the set is 2.5. So what's the dimension of what set? The set on which the circulation resides the higher order moments of it anyhow. So the low order moments are space filling in the sense they are Kolmogorov like. And the high moments are sitting on this line, uh, which, is, which gives you a dimension 2.5. To see this a little bit better, uh, so it suggests some bifractal scaling. What I now compute is, I only showed you even orders so far. Now I am going to compute all moments 
by taking absolute values, whose, really whose meaning is not exactly clear. But that's what I do. So I go almost to minus 1, and I compute everything. And you see this line is Kolmograph. So low order moments are sitting on Kolmograph, but high order moments, meaning above 4 and beyond, are sitting on this line whose, uh, whose dimension is 2 and a half. This circulation exponent. It's a quantity like circulation, but you put up the values. Absolute values, yes. Okay. Because I have to, uh, if I want to compute anything other than uh, even order moments, I have to do so something like that. Uh, where is the absolute value? Is the question for me. So you, it's so defined in terms of, because it's no, no longer equal in terms of vorticity and velocity now. So how do you compute it? Yeah, so I compute uh, like this. So the circula circulation would be u dot l, uh, line integral. <coughs> now I take uh, absolute value of this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. so that's, uh, uh, so uh, I don't know. I ask a question anyhow. So another thing is that, let's go back here. Um, how do I know um, whether this thing changes its shape as I increase the Reynolds number. Um, so this is for that Reynolds number, that size box. That's the biggest box I have, so I can't go any higher. But I can always do them for lower ones, and I calculate how um, they change as a function of Reynolds number. So what I'm going to do is take this difference between the Kolmograph value and the actual measured value for different uh, order of moments. And I'm going to see how this delta changes as a function of Reynolds number. Eventually, if it changes uh, slowly as a function of Reynolds number, maybe they will all reach Kolmograph. I don't know. We'll see. So what you find is that if you plot, uh, plot the difference, this is delta, the delta that you saw as a function of Reynolds number. This is the highest Reynolds number that I have. But I also have low Reynolds numbers. And these are experimental values, and these are all simulations. Now, if I take p equals 4, that is in the previous graph, I sit here, and I ask, how fast will this difference vanish? And I go to 6, and I ask, how far will that vanish, et cetera. That's what I do. Um, so you see, for fourth, it seems like it is some power law with uh, that exponent. So if I had uh, higher Reynolds numbers, and the behavior were sort of extrapolatable, uh, maybe it would go like that. I, I don't know. Who knows? And for this uh, order moment, which is sixth, the, it's a lower power. That is, it approaches uh, Kolmograph much, sl much more slowly. And this even slower, and this even slower, 6 and 8. So the picture is that I would have, um, I, I would have this is the Kolmograph line. And uh, this is now order of the moment, order p. And these are those exponents, lambda. Okay. So uh, for this Reynolds number, up to here it is Kolmograph, and beyond that is some line. So if I went to higher Reynolds numbers, according to this, what would happen is, say, fourth order will have uh, come there, and uh, then the others would be smaller differences. And now if I increase the Reynolds number even higher, well, it would be like that, and be like that. So it changes, and technically there will always be some moment for which it deviates from Kolmograph, but more and more it becomes like Kolmograph. So that's the deduction from as you, as, you the, as you increase the Reynolds number. And this is a speculation on the basis of extrapolation. So I, I don't know whether this will actually be true, but that's where. Uh, so all moments approach K41. Higher moments more slowly. For any Reynolds number, there's always some moment above which exponents do not fall on uh, Kolmograph. Could the 
this, this, this love of that bifurcation could also change. Uh, well, it will change. It will definitely change. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's uh, uh, okay. Now, in order to uh, so, uh, it would be nice to know how high do I have to go in order to be more conclusive on this. I can always say, well, go to higher Reynolds number. Go to higher Reynolds numbers, and this is the bane of turbulence uh, experimental work, anyhow. So I want to ask, how high? do I have to really go in order to say something? And what I am going to do is, is to estimate that here. What is plotted against the size of the box, R, uh, is the fourth moment, the normalized fourth moment called flatness. Uh, yeah, that's why I used F. This is circulation uh, to the power 4 average divided by circulation square to the power 2. Now, you can see what happens. Reynolds number, low Reynolds numbers, it has a tendency that is uh, slowly and very smoothly going down to zero. So there is no region in R space where it is a constant, which should be the case if you had self-similar behavior over scale range. But as the Reynolds number increases, you can see the tendency for the shoulder to form, and there is a constancy to form. This is very unlike velocities, uh, velocity increments. You see, this is the circulation uh, plotted against, um, and also velocities. Velocities are very smooth and uh, no tendency to, to be a constant. So my speculation is that if I increase the Reynolds number a little bit more, this would become much flatter in this region. And maybe a little bit higher, it would be essentially flat. So to, in order to uh, assess that, I will get the slope of this. This is a tendency towards Gaussianity? Uh, no Gaussianity, whatever. But some sort of a tendency to it. So the Gaussian is flat? Uh, well, it is not. Gaussian would give you a flatness of 3. Mm. Uh, See, I mean, it would give you a flatness of 3. But this would be a very different value. But it would just. Uh, have a flatness of constant. So I'm going to take the slopes of these lines. You see, the, uh, here it is the slope, uh, you know, uh, large value, small value, small value, small value. Here it has some kind of behavior towards a minimum. Here it has more of a tendency towards minimum. So. I want to compute the Reynolds number, or estimate the Reynolds number, at which it really shows uh, a minimal uh, constancy. You see what I'm saying? Um, so I have it on the next slide, but maybe I should explain that a little bit. So I take the slope of uh, this line, let's say, what it has as a function of r that slope here, um, it has some large value for small r's. I would like it to be flat like this and go like that. But instead, what it does is, um, I don't know, may maybe like that. I, I, sh I shouldn't have. I, what I would like is this. I would like it to be like that. But what it does is, it has this kind of behavior. Uh, uh, first zero of the slope. What's that? You're looking at the first uh, zero of the slope. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not the zero exactly, but it is where the minimum is. Yeah. So now, if uh, this, I want to know at what point it actually becomes begins to show this flat behavior, and so I plot in the next uh, next thing this minimum value as a function of Reynolds numbers, these are all the data we have. Just extrapolating, it says I must get that Reynolds number, which is only twice as large as the Reynolds number we have. We can do it. We'll do it in the next year or so. So we think that if I go that far, uh, some of the questions we have asked uh, about, about small differences and small changes, maybe they will all vanish. I don't know. OK, so I should be able to answer all of that in the next year or so. Now, 
uh, perhaps about twice as much as I said takes a year. <coughs> now let's talk about what Migdal did, uh, which I think is quite interesting, and uh, it comes to the point that you were just making earlier. So what did uh, Migdal do in the uh, 90s? He derived this functional equation for the probability density of uh, circulation or this uh, contour. It's a functional equation. And uh, as I said, nobody knows how to solve it. And he didn't even uh, try. So he looked at the fixed point of this loop equation, this functional equation. And uh, he showed that uh, is a minimal area uh, uh, satisfies this loop equation. And he did some asymptotics. It actually corresponds to the tails of the distribution. And he showed the specific results. And that was, he postulated this area law that it would be independent of the aspect ratio, but only for uh, asymptotic uh, reasons. Um, and uh, this is the most important thing uh, he, he did. And uh, that's where the matter lied for uh, uh, many years. And after he saw these papers, he uh, sort of got excited. And his new work, all of this in, in uh, minimal areas. It was not for loops in planes. And I couldn't really do all these minimal areas in uh, computations. It's a big uh, thing in itself. So I was doing it only for planes all the time. Uh, but the equations never really were for Sorry, the planes. Can you say what that means again. So it's basically I take a loop, I take the the thing of the soap film type stuff that yeah. goes with it, and yeah. I somehow yeah. yeah. change. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so it's sort of like to solve yeah. a plateau problem for each loop. And uh, so something, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so his functional equation involves different different a whole family of different curves, right? That's correct. Yeah, right, that's but correct. Are planar, then, then isn't that the, already the the plane? That must be to simplify this. It's, it's really simplified. Now, see, for him, he couldn't do the plane thing uh, right away. Somehow, he had to go through this functional equation in order to really get to the plane, which was sort of very interesting. So what he did was he now reduced it all to planar loops, and he showed that the area law must hold. OK. This works, works in a class of plane. In, in a plane, uh, but yeah. This is the PDF for the circulation not normalized by, so it's not a relative thing, it is really the circulation. So it's the, in, the circulation or some moment of the circulation, but not, not normalized by the second moment, not a relative thing. I think it is relative, but uh, I, will I will have to check. Because it makes a very big difference. It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. But I'm pretty sure it was relative, but uh, OK, I will so check, I will check. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But I think it is for relative. Now then, w I will show you how he actually deduced this very simply. Uh, it is not a proof. Um, I mean, even for my level of proof, it is not exactly a proof. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not a mathematician, so I see, I don't know what the proof is. <laughs> so, um, but. Having seen the experimental data, uh, such as speculated, it must be true for all moments as well. Um, and he's, he also said it's true for se second and uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional turbulence. And then he clarified the various past issues, which were much too complicated uh, needlessly in some fashion. And then. Uh, the, all this clarification came about because such a Polikov uh, actually got interested in this after our meeting here. He was here, and I mentioned this in passing. And then he went to his office, and he sent me an explicit calculation which showed that area law cannot work. Um, how, uh, and I will tell you how he calculated it. And. Uh, but if you actually look at uh, my uh, slides, um, you, you won't remember, but um, OK, this one here, 
uh, I actually plotted uh, Polyakov's formula. It's uh, not uh, green, uh, not uh, blue somehow. It's the same line. Uh, you see, I mean, he is right technically, but it is not that uh, that varying. Uh, so you might say, yeah, he's right, but um, but okay, maybe not uh, not that important. So you mean because the discrepancy is so, so because small. it is so small, it is relatively small, and uh, I could say, well, maybe uh, where am I going? I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, so that's uh, where I was. Well, to some extent, it has to depend on the parameter as well, because as you go away from the inertial change, yeah. you yeah. need to change, and yeah. the ch abrupt change is not Absolutely, abrupt. absolutely. So, but if you are in the inertial range, the claim is that it wouldn't depend on the aspect ratio. But Sasha's calculation, which I will show you a little bit of, uh, says that it should vary provided you assume Kolmogorov. In some sense, if it is exactly Kolmogorov, it should vary a little bit. But I'm not claiming it is Kolmogorov. It is actually always slightly different from Kolmogorov. So it is compatible. Um, but by Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov, you mean actual Kolmogorov? 41. Kolmogorov, uh, seven, six. No, 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 actual Kolmogorov. So uh, let, me, let me say, let me say what Migdal did. So here is Sasha Palikov's calculation. You take circulation squared like that. So you have uh, velocity correlation along the circumference. And if Kolmogorov were right, it would go like some power of the separation distance uh, between the two points. Let's call this 2 alpha minus 1. I mean, it's not important what you uh, call it. Then you can actually do the integration if it is like a power law. And you can show that it is not a function only of L1 times L2, but it's L1 and L2 appear separately. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, alpha equals 2 thirds is Kolmogorov, and that is particularly true for that. And that was uh, uh, Polikoff's point. But what did was, well, what if alpha is half? Then this must go like a logarithm. And then you can do the integration, and it is exactly only dependent on the area. Well, that was a very clever observation. So of course, I don't know whether it goes like logarithm or not. This is something I have to try, try to find. So this is now. Uh, one point here on the circulation contour, and another point there, and I have to do that one. So um, alpha equal to half, and the area law are completely compatible. So it just follows. Uh, it's nice you can make the explicit calculation. And that's uh, in one of his recent uh, papers. So this works for uh, second order moment. And so Sasha said, well, I can't really calculate it for uh, all high order moments, but probably it is true for high order moments. And so he said lambda p must go like p, it just, just from this thing. But in practice, it should have some finite uh, corrections for finite Reynolds numbers. So in fact, he would not fit my data according to a straight line that I had drawn, 7.6p, but he would fit it as <laughs> p plus some corrections. Uh, no, we, uh, I'll show you this in a minute. But he doesn't know what the function, what the form of the correction must be. So you can assume many kinds of things, logarithms and some uh, uh, some part approximations and all kinds of things. So uh, I will show you just uh, now in a minute. So uh, to uh, to show the difference uh, better, I plot not lambda p but lambda p by p. This. Uh, um, makes it a little bit clearer as a function of p. Uh, these are the data points. Um, 
with uh, error bars this time plotted as well. And uh, the linear fit that I had with 7.6p is like that, you see? So it's really not doing as well as I would, I would like. Although on, a, on that plot it looked very nice, but it really is uh, not exactly that. But Sasha said, well, it's going like p uh, to the leading order plus some other corrections. Suppose I take a polynomial approximation for this correction, uh, you know, which of course becomes unity as, as you increase p, then you get this line, which is uh, the line that goes through all the data points. Of course, it would be nice if I could have data there and see whether that's true or not. And there's no reason why I should use this, uh, uh, this form, uh, this form, um, but I could use others. And I can fix it to be going through all the data points ex so extremely well. Kind of yeah. Filling? The only thing is that it should be P plus something. Exactly. So that is but his. Yeah. Like cl close to the end of the inertial rate. Then delta u needs to vanish. In other words, the circulation cannot scale only like r. It has to scale so that after I divide by r, it still goes to zero as r goes to zero. Because the length of the thing is r, and the thing is small, and the difference of velocities across that distance should go to zero as you go down. So you, you're talking about box size becoming smaller and smaller? Yeah. Are, at the end of the inertial range. Which end? Which, which, which? Uh, 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 yeah. To, yeah. To, to infinity. So uh, across 100 eta, the difference of velocity goes to zero as, an, you know, as, as a function of eta. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're going to be you, you cannot have uh, this scale like R. Um, it has to scale R to 1 plus a little bit. Let me uh, come back to this with you, Peter. I mean, uh, I, I'm. You can stop the scaling before you go to small scale, so then, then it doesn't go to the end of the inertial range. Well, it has to go span the inertial range, but where is the end? I, uh, well, it's just uh, okay. the statement yeah. that delta u yeah. has to go to zero at some point. Uh, at some point, yeah. I mean, it's, so it has some Im important implications. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so it should be p p p to the power one plus something is. Then I'm I'm not objecting. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm just telling you the status as it is, but uh, you may be right. Let's think about this. I'll, I'll uh, think think more. Mm. This is uh, an interesting point. I will uh, have to think about this a little bit more. Okay, um, I'll still continue in spite of being unable to answer your question. We need to finish up fairly soon. Uh, I'm sorry, it's taken longer. Well, you got a lot of next one. Next one is the last one. Um, uh, Victor Yakort, in the meantime, what he did was, you take the pth power, it has a product of many things. You just assume you can decompose them in a Gaussian form for I mean, it's trivial to do, like the uh, usual uh, thing people have done in the past. And of course, he gets uh, numbers like this, uh, which so I don't think they mean very much. So it's certainly not doing the right thing. Okay, now my conclusions. Um, so in the admittedly incomplete work so far, I, I admit that, circulation statistics depend essentially on the area of the loop, not on the aspect ratio, as long as it is both sides are contained in the inertial range. The PDF tails are almost exponential, for which there is no explanation. Um, scalar area holds, not the vector counterpart. Uh, I think uh, those are both the very interesting conclusions. Uh, they must mean lots of things, but we don't know. Uh, PDFs of gamma r are, uh, collapse well on the Kolmogorov scaling, but far from Gaussian. Um, there is a decent scaling range in the experiments, and scaling exponents are closely linear. 
Um, circulation is less intermittent for, from the graphs I showed you. Uh, low moments are closely K41. High moments seem to reside on a fractal set of 2.5. So that's why I called it bifractal. Other data of its are possible. In particular, Migdal's form, linear form, fit the data slightly better, but we need higher data to be conclusive, and uh, those based on Gaussian splitting do not work. Uh, one needs to double the Reynolds number and increase the moment order, etc. So I think in a, in a short order, uh, there must be, it must be possible to answer many questions. Uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, in a nice and interesting stage at this point. So thank you.